So we're now heading in to the main site of Gigantia here on Gozo. Now, I was last here in 2015, I created a video about it. But today I brought the Osmo camera in here and I've got some beautiful aerial photography so we can have another look at it from a different perspective. But what's fascinating about this really, number one, there's many legends of giants associated with these temples in Malta. One of the most interesting, obviously, is that of Sansuna, who is said to have created Gigantia. So it's said that Sansuna was a giant goddess, like a giantess, who would stride across the landscape with her baby on her back and stones in her apron, and eating beans for strength and power. And she would drop stones as she strided across the landscape. And one of these sites was Gigantia, another one was Sansuna Dolmen. And potentially, because they join up in a ley line going all the way to Malta, Bujiba Temple as well. But when you look at some of these stones, you'll see why they chose it to be built by giants because they're so huge. Some of the stones here are probably 100 tons or more. And there were more stones here, as we can see in the old paintings that were done in the 1800s. There were stones that were like building, like there was another wall, a very large wall. There was more trilithons here. Some of the stones got taken away. And with Jara Stone Circle, it's even worse. The whole thing's been pretty much destroyed, unfortunately. And you get a sense of the scale of the site here just from a distance it is really quite remarkable and you can see the, the stones they would have been much neater and tidier when they were first constructed the limestone would have been carved fairly smooth like we saw in the museum perhaps you know an example is the serpent carving the whole stone is very smoothly cut and shaped like we find at Gebekli Tepe this would have been like that this would have been beautifully cut beautifully shaped stones this could have been the first ever polygonal wall constructed anywhere in the world. If you look at it carefully, you can just see. We'll get closer in and have a look, but I'll just do a little zoom in so you can get a sense of it. But these could have been polygonal walls. They're certainly cyclopean because they're absolutely massive, but they could have been polygonal, but they've been weathered so badly, they've lost the quality. And we, you know, luckily, places like Hei Jahim, they have been preserved because they were buried in the ground. And so you still see some of the detail, but not so much here, unfortunately. We'll just have a little walk around. You see some aerial shots that I took at sunset and uh, sunrise again this morning. And it really is an amazing, amazing place. start to get a sense of scale when you walk a little bit closer these are absolutely massive stones you can just see the shape of these stones they're very irregular they're very they are polygonal in some senses and you can see the way they've got large flat stones and they've got other stones kind of slotting outwards now this is a style we find at the other temples it could be to keep everything up but every one of these stones would have been nicely shaped and curved beautifully dressed it would have been quite different to what we see now. We see some examples in other sites where you see this quality of stonework, but to me, this could be the earliest polygonal, possibly the earliest cyclopean wall in the whole of Europe. So these gigantic walls would have gone all the way around the temple. They're freestanding, so they're not dug into the ground. So this was the old, known as the oldest freestanding temple in the whole of the world until Gebekli Tepe was discovered. And you can understand why. Much of it has fallen. They've got construction up here to try and preserve it. But, you know, this goes back to at least 3,000 to 4,000 BC. It could be much older now with the new research coming out suggesting the dating could be completely wrong. It could be over 8,000 BC. It reminds me of the Sphinx Temple and the outer edge of the Valley Temple with the huge limestone that's badly weathered. Cyclopean blocks, semi-polygonal, mega-sized chunks. And you have this here that looks like, it shows you a good example of the way that there's a flat stone and then stones parallel to each other with the flat stone in between, which is part of the makeup of the walls here at Gigantia and many of the sites in ancient uh, Gozo and Malta. So of the facades of the two temples, only the outer corners remain standing. The central part of the facade between the two main doorways was already in ruins by 1827, when it was painted by Charles Frederick de Brock Toff. 
and it could have happened soon after that because it does show that this was indeed or much of this was in place but you can just see some of the blocks here they're absolutely huge hence the name gigantia and they were placing huge blocks right up top there as well as we go in here is actually this area here you can see actually a bowl carved bowl we have several of these kind of carved into the ground here and all the stone spheres so large quantities of these stone spheres have been found at sites all over Gozo and Malta many believe they were used for the transportation of the stones the large megalithic blocks possibly along the cart ruts in some theories but their use really is unknown but the fact is there are thousands of these all over the megalithic sites specifically the neolithic temples of ancient Malta so just below the entrance here we have a massive stone slab which you don't walk on anymore it's actually underneath it's found in 1933 and underneath it's a pottery sherds and a bowl filled with 158 seashells and a horn of a bull and you can see these in the in the main uh, museum in, on site here this is an actual bull's horn suggesting the bull cult was strong here like it is in other sites in malta and the mediterranean and also another vessel which seems to represent the bull horn again this was found at the entrance to the southern the larger temple at gigantia and we just continue in here to the south temple this is we can see how big some of these blocks are and we have stone uh, holes carved and sort of indents carved like cut marks huge cut marks mega blocks down the bottom here this is where the two stone heads were found uh, in 1836 and there was a block here which is no longer in place which has been moved that was you know a classic double spiral block that is kind of represented here you know it shows you what it would have looked like This is one of the menhirs or standing stones. This is in one of the outer rooms of the South Temple. Now this conical stone is also a tradition that we do find in Sardinia with the betel stones. And this is really an, a stone that's imbued with spirit and it was often placed in the center of the temple, much like a, um, you know some in some traditions much like a ting site or a moot stone where the energy of the site would be kind of charged and also with well, this one this was actually found in the outer wall of the south temple you can see that on the map there this just shows you an image of the south temple as drawn back in the 1800s we also have from the same South Temple, we have these limestone heads, which are in the back of one of the rooms in the temple itself, which we're obviously going to go and have a look at. And these are very reminiscent of some of the heads we see around Gebekli Tepe and Southeast Turkey. And again, you see here, this is where it was discovered where the arrow is pointing. It's also this area where the, obviously the great serpents were found as well, the great serpent carving which brings me to this connection with Gebekli Tepe and even Egypt as well. But it's this stone here that really gets my attention. I noticed this a few years ago when I was here because it clearly has a very beautifully cut 3D serpent going all the way down to the bottom. And this is a beautifully cut piece of stone. You can see here crosses have more recently been carved onto it. But this was found um, again in the South Temple and it was uh, moved indoors in 1957 but what is interesting about this if we just look at this carefully this is almost identical to one that we see in the museum at the site of Saqqara in Egypt as well as obviously all over the temples of Gebekli Tepe the Valdi Churi and other places in Southeast Turkey now it looks quite different to what it to what it was in the 1800s and you can see the difference there and uh very very different actually there was red ochre paint was found in here these are natural ochres that have been found uh, in the area 
uh, there were many sources over Malta, but this is again, this is a tradition of using this red paint that we find all over the world. And the fragments of this plaster with this ochre was on, was again found in the South Temple, just over to the left where the arrow's pointing, as you can see on the screen there. We have huge holes carved in the base of the stones there. We've got a little robbing. It's like about to run through the hole by the looks of it. Oh, go on, go in the hole. Oh well. That one's been cut all the way through. Some kind of rope may have been put through there. But this is certainly very interesting. Whatever anyone says about this, this is, and I believe it could be as old as what the new research is saying, connecting it with Sirius. We have polygonal kind of pavement blocks here. We have this cyclopean construction on the interior walls of the temple. Thin stones here, thin limestone blocks, not dissimilar to what we find at Gebekli Tepe. Very interesting. There's also like a libation table in the entrance there. But they've created platforms here like they did at, you know, Hajjakim and other places. But over here is intriguing because they have kind of altars, which again are reminiscent of many different places around the world. And you can see there's three different niches. You know, is this then a triptych temple as Richard Cassaro would call it? And these were discovered intact, uh, but they got destroyed again in 1901, but they got repurposed and re-put back in place because of good old Brocktorf's uh, illustrations and paintings. He was able to work out exactly where they would go. And you see the outer wall, it would have been much higher than this. It would have been almost over twice the height. Then we have these thin slabs we find all over the temple. Absolutely amazing site, really. I'm just, I love this site. This sort of sloped corridor with these blocks at the base, which have this sort of pitted or, you know, markings on them. And it could be to highlight the importance or something. It could be like a symbol of the ancients they were placing in here. And you can see the inner wall has got smaller stones making up its construction. But the outer wall is where the mega blocks are behind it. So this is not dissimilar to the Valley Temple and the Sphinx Temple in ancient Egypt on the Giza Plateau. And here is, you know, pretty much to the southeast. This is very close to the winter solstice, although because it's so wide, it could have had sunlight coming in from different areas. And now it's thought it may have even been aligned with Sirius, which would have risen on the winter solstice, but later in the day, which is a theory put together by James Swagger about Newgrange. And so is it the same kind of feature where they're working with Sirius as their main, as their main star, which would help them record procession? which is something we know that the ancient people thoroughly enjoyed doing over many, many generations and lifetimes. So this was discovered in the front terrace of Gigantia back in 1954. Dates back to the Neolithic period, part of a bowl, uh, and it is incised with fire in. Now this is interesting because it clearly shows some kind of bird creature that could even be a plumed serpent, I'm not too sure, but this is quite famous and it's one of the earliest most intricate carvings here in this part of the world. So we're now heading into what's called the North Temple slightly to the north of the southern temple clearly um, so that's the main entrance to the north temple it was cleared in 1936 and it could well have had stones going over the top um, like a trilithon some early paintings do depict this and you can see here that from one of the other sites on Malta from Manjura, Manjura that they do depict this and there's even a carving at that site and you can see the mega blocks on the outside here just making up the outer wall let's go in there and take a look there's some interesting features in here and these are some of the this is where the big stones would have gone over the top obviously they kind of flattened off the top part there 
that's where it would have gone you can see some of the neat and tidy stones here some of these are being slightly reconstructed but not too much and you can see the outer wall there just to get a sense of the scale it's like what 40 feet up in the up in the air there's a rectangular hollow suggesting metal tools were used to create this so was that then repurposed when metal was being used in this particular site maybe in the bronze age we have a whole stone which they thought may have been used for ropes or poles but they could have had some other purpose you know could it have been a, an example of a soul hole as it would be at Gebekli Tepe in southeast Turkey so I've just spotted I think is a JJ Ainsworth just around the corner I can see a bit of technology and a hand sticking out there but this does suggest JJ Ainsworth is here and she is doing some filming she's trying to pretend she can't she's wearing limestone colored clothes so she thinks i can't see her but i did see her and there she goes well i said a rare sighting and she's run she's gone <laughs> thing about this temple is that it has upper coralline limestone in it which is the harder type of limestone generally the interior of the temples were made of the globigerina limestone the soft one but here you can see examples where they actually use the much harder difficult to carve stones in the construction another thing we find with uh, Gigante and other temples in Malta is the shape of them is not just reminiscent of like this sort of multiple kidney shape it's actually the shape of the goddess Sansuna we, we know the full figured body like we see in the statues so even with the legends of her potentially creating this site and the statues the actual shape of these temples is reminiscent of that particular kind of layout and design and there's also very intricate hidden geometry here which has been some good research done on that actually and this aligns with the geometry then links with the astronomy and now this new research on Sirius the brightest star in the sky at 8000 BC so thanks for watching Megalithomaniacs please become a patron please subscribe and we'll see you next time